Okay, Chuck, go ahead. Okay, hello everybody, good evening. I thank you for uh, signing in. Uh, this evening we're going to learn a little bit about uh, the person we had were told that we had most admire most, and that's uh, King, King David. We did learn a little bit about him last week when we uh, studied the story of his relationship with his first wife, uh, Michal. It didn't end well. Uh, and just uh, as a tease, next week we're going to talk about um, a mistake which happened 2,000 years ago and why the Levites really are truly more important than the Kohanim. Uh, following that, we'll, on the last session of our course, we'll be discussing some more issues about we're talking more about David and his uh, romantic life and his relationship with his children. Uh, but this evening, we're going to look at David from two different points of view. The first point of view, and you can see it on your screen, is the story of David and Goliath. Now, if anybody has any questions during this, please raise your hand. We can see if you raise your hand, or and Alan will uh, unmute you, and so we can, is that okay, Alan? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, so the, again, there'll be no rules. If anybody has questions, please, please raise their hand. So many of you, many of us know the story of David and Goliath. At least we allegedly know the story of David and Goliath. It's the Horatio Alger story. It's the story of the, the young man who fights giants and, and ultimately succeeds. But if we really look at the text and what the text tells us, we, uh, we can, we, and a totally different understanding can be derived. Uh, it's not all, and, and, and it's very interesting because it's a very long story. In the, in the first book of Samuel, we have 51 verses devoted to the story of David and Goliath. That's, that's remarkable if you think about how many you know, consecutive verses are devoted to any other biblical figure. This is it's, it's astounding. So let's take the, I want to take the story apart and then we'll try to put it back together. Um, but keep in mind that the, one of the questions we have to answer is why did the people, let's call them the chroniclers, why did the people who who wrote this uh, story or placed this story into our text, uh, do it. What was their, I'm getting all these different pictures here, Alan. Sorry. Um, I'm about... I misclicked. Okay, where, where no. There we go. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, so Let's just begin with this with Goliath. Okay, now allegedly speaking, supposedly, Saul in his, was constantly being besieged by the Philistines. And at one point, actually there were many different tribes that he was attempting to, to, um, to after all, he took his land to fight off, but the text just tells it was the Philistines or the Philistines. So we're told that a great battle was about to take place in the Valley of Elah which today is a great wine growing industry, by the way. It's a wonderful place to visit. If you go from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, you go right past it. Anyway, uh, we're told that, that our people are on one side of the hill of the valley and Goli the Philistines are on the other side. And there is this giant named Goliath. Well, it's very confusing for me because when we look at the text, if we go back to um, the book of the book of Judges, we find that there are, there are many people who could have been called Goliath. Uh, as you see in the, in the italics, in 2 Samuel 21, 16, and 17, Ishbineach, the, the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, was girded with a new sword and sought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruah, came to his aid, attacked the Philistine, and killed him. Now, so there's another giant who's about to kill David. But more importantly, this, his sword weighed a certain number of shekels. Now, you have to understand that David allegedly lived in the 10th century BCE. Probably, let's say this story took place around 950. But shekels, shekels weren't invented until Maccabean times. You know, when, the, when was the, one of the Maccabees? Who can tell me? Michael. Oh, I see Steve, Pilchuk, when? Or Norm, you have to unmute, unmute him. 
BBC or 160? Yeah, 165 BCE. In other words, 700 years later, <laughs> shekels, shekels are invented. Um, they actually came from, uh, from, from, from Greece and then they moved, and they moved into uh, Carthage That's and nice. eventually they came, and they, they came into the area which we today call Israel. And then they were told that there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on his toes and his hands, 24 in number, descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, David's son of Shimei, David's brother slew him. And again, we're told there was a war with the Philistines uh, at Gob and Elchanan, and uh, the, uh, Goliath of Gath was, was, was killed by somebody else. So already we have two, pro two problems with the story. One, was there really a Goliath who killed him? And two, when was this story written? Because the weight of shekels was, you know, pre, you know, it didn't happen for hundreds and hundreds of years later. Now, the story begins in a very interesting way. This is, um, this is David's entrance into our history. Samuel, the prophet, the last of the judges, um, the priest, and the kingmaker, Samuel embodied all of the institutions that existed in the time in one person, it gets, is, it is, is dissatisfied with Saul and goes and, and, and selects David um, as, as, the next, as the next king. And we have this wonderful story about David and, and, and his father. David is the, the youngest, is it, I have an echo. Some, let's try again. All right, David is the, is the seventh son, again, an auspicious number. And uh, his father sends him to bring food to his brother who is fighting in Saul's war. And he brings the food to Saul's brother and he looks and he sees Goliath there. And he says, who is that guy? And, Saul's bro and David's brother treats him the way many of us have treated younger brothers, younger siblings. He said, stop being a wise kid. What are you doing? He says, oh, no, I want to go fight him. God's on my side. This is a classic soap opera venue. And if you take the time to read the story, you will see, you will see authors' messages flashing in lights. You will see the, he'll hear the, read the dialogue that, that demonstrates the soap opera quality of this amazing story. So, Finally, Sam, David goes into a soldier and says, what's going on here? And the soldier says, well, if we kill Goliath, whoever kills Goliath, well, Saul was going to let him marry his daughter. He'll become a prince in the kingdom. And David likes this idea, and he starts talking about it. I can do it. I can do it. And eventually, his, this come, he's brought to Saul. And Saul looks at, who is a tall man, according to the text, looks at this young, young boy who... We're, I'm guessing it's somewhere around 15, 16. And uh, somehow David convinces him to let him go and fight. And so Saul says, here, you just can't go and fight. How are you going to do this? And he said, well, I'm going to do it because uh, God's on my side. And I kill lions and bears and tigers, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. And Saul says, no, you need, you need armor. So Saul gives, puts his armor on David and gives him his sword. And you can imagine that so David starts to walk and he falls down on the floor. He's too weak and too small to carry this armor, but he keeps on saying, don't worry, God is on my side. What happens next is that David takes, his, takes off the armor. He goes to meet Goliath. There's some amazing posturing back and forth between the two of them. Literally, like you can see, if you were in a bar today and you saw two men posturing, trying to get into a fight, you would hear the language. At one point, David says, I'm going to take, take you uncircumcised guy and string you up. And Goliath says, I'm going to feed you to the crows. And this, this is what's, what's going on back and forth, back and forth. Now, most of you know the rest of the story, allegedly the rest of the story. David takes a sling, throws it, and it hits Goliath, the stone hits Goliath in the head, and he dies. But what happens next is really important. 
because David takes Goliath's sword and he picks it up and he chops off Goliath's head and he takes it and he hangs it on the walls of Jerusalem. Now, it's, it's very interesting because he's in the Valley of Elah with Saul. You would think he would take Goliath's head to Saul, but no, he goes to the valley and he hangs it on, on the walls of Jerusalem. Now, why would he do that? Anybody? This is before Jerusalem is a city, by the way. Jerusalem, by the way, in the ninth century BC, was a small little backwater, like Kayamisha Lake was in the Catskills. You know, <laughs> a tiny little town with maybe some little settlements around it, in the de kind of in the, in the hills, but there was no commerce. They were off the trade routes. Um, this is not a place you want to invest land and you buy land for the future. But he does this, he takes the head, he places it on, on the walls. Why would he do it? Here's a question. Was that where he was from? I mean, was it like to show off his prowess? No, he wasn't from there at all. Norm. Did he have a vision that Jerusalem would be the city? Well, Jerusalem was clearly located in an important part, but I don't think so at that point. Uh, let me ask the, the question. What was David's job? What did he do for a living? Shepherd. 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 And what does a shepherd do? And sheep. sheep. What? <laughs> what he protects he his flock. flock. He protects his flock. Okay. And who? And, and so, with David's taking this, taking Goliath's head, hanging it up on the wall in Jerusalem, is demonstrates that he that he as a shepherd will protect his flock. Who's his flock? Israel. His people at a future time. So this is, this is foreshadowing. <coughs> okay. Now, let's go back to the story for a second and, and let's talk about Goliath. So we have a lot of, the, the text tells us how big Goliath is. He said that, hmm, there we go. Okay. He tells us how, how large Goliath is. But we have some interesting um, challenges there because, uh, well, I did the, I, according to Josephus, it's, he was one size. According to the text, he was nine feet tall. His spears and his weight, 300 pounds, et cetera, et cetera. I did some of the measurements myself trying to uh, figure out how much, uh, you know, a, a shekel would weigh during that period of time. And I came up with seven feet, six inches. He was probably carrying somewhere between 300 and 400 pounds. Of, of armor on him, he was a big guy. But there's a problem with that because the weapons that Goliath, the armor that Goliath was wearing was sixth century Greek armor. And to say it another way, Goliath was, it, the story tells us that Goliath was wearing armor that had, would not be invented for another 300 to 400 years. Now, what happened in the 6th century BCE? That's a question. Anybody? Yes, Stephen. Oh, he you touched your hand. He's got a chicken in the back. I'm sorry. Um, Michael. Josiah. No, well, Josiah was a little bit earlier. This is he, was six, he was 610 to 630, roughly. Six, no, we're, but we're talking about the 6th century, which means it's 5-something or other. Oh, the 6th century is the 5th fifth, fifth century? Yeah. It's a, like 580, what happened like 586? The destruction, the destruction, the destruction of the temple. It's right, the destruction of the temple. And where were our ancestors? Babylon. Were Babylon. You, they were in, we were Babylon. in Babylon. Okay. Now, there's something, what, there's, why Greek armor? If our ancestors didn't the armor, why Greek armor? Well, actually, if you, if you read the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, because you will find that that armor was invented, Homer tells us that armor was invented and was used during that period of time. And just to throw this out, while there are 24 books of the Bible, there are also 24 books of Homer. So let's go back for a second now and ask the initial question. Why would the people who wrote our, this story, the chroniclers, Ha, create this, write this story 
sometime after 586 BCE in Babylon. Think of it now. Who is the, who is the, David? Someone speaking? Isn't it from the shadow? Maybe they want to give some hope that there is something to return to. They have a new, they can defeat the empire, which is that, of course, the Babylonian ben, empire. Benny, you're on the right, you're, Benny, you're on the right track because David was the Jewish people and Babylon was the giant. Mm -hmm. This was a story that our ancestors wrote or they took from legends and, and, and as such and they put this together because what did they want to do? They wanted our ancestors to go, to, to, they wanted David to defeat the giant and to, go, and to be able to go back to the promised land. The story of David and Goliath is an allegory about the Jewish people. Now, it obviously went through further redactions because as I said, shekels were a Maccabean piece, which happened hundreds of years after the Babylonian exile. So the story was probably, be began to be shaped in Babylon. And then hundreds of years later, probably, was probably um, fine tuned to the form that we have, have today. Any questions? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's not a question. That having, having said that now, and I think it's an important lesson. Let's look at the second part. Do I see a hand, Michael? Yes. Is there any architectural evidence that there ever was a David and a, and a Goliath battle? There's no archaeological evidence that there was ever an actual battle. That's right next to the gas between, station on the hill. That, excuse me. What? There's a gas station. They say it's down the hill from here. That's right. There's a gas station, but, but there's no, they, they didn't find any, there's no armor that has been found. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any, there aren't weapons that have been found um, in the Valley of Ela. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday they will be found. Uh, now we're gonna step forward a little bit. This also, I think this is an important thing to think about David. David, David was a young man who had a dream. Mm -hmm. He had a vision. Um, maybe it was a, theoretically, maybe it was a pure vision. Think of all of us when we are adolescents or just going into our early 20s. We have, we want, we have a, a vision of who we want to be and what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Some people might say that this is how David or when David heard God's voice. Maybe this is what it means to hear God's voice. But as David matures and gets older and is forced to deal with the political situation that occur when one is building a business. It's just the normal activities in life. David's vision perhaps has changed as it might have been for many of, many of us. And so we're now going to skip ahead. This is um, just after the lesson we had last week where David uh, you know, reclaims his first wife, Michal, and places her, you know, in a tower for the rest of her life where she can no longer have children. Um, we're now going to, just, just go, we're now going to focus on the David who was in the process of consolidating his power. I'll wait till, till Alan changes his screen. Okay, I didn't know you were going to that uh, point now. Yes, so now we're going to the story of Ritzbach. In a moment. Hey, Ritzbach. I'm going to pause the recording. This is, this is it. This is it. Okay. Uh, Saul and Jonathan are killed at the Battle of Ritzbach by the Philistines. And which basically meant that the country was without a king. Uh, David, who had been... Somebody has to mute themselves because I'm getting an echo. Norm, could you mute yourself? Yes, sure. Could you mute yourself? It's me, but... Okay. Um, David, after his story with Goliath, had a very, very checkered career. He went out and he, um, he fought for Saul for a long time. Saul chased him around. He gained a great reputation. Uh, Saul killed hundreds and David had killed thousands. 
And eventually what happened was David developed enough of a reputation that he formed his own militia. And the only militia in the ancient, in, at, at that time in that land. And when Saul died without an heir, without a legitimate heir having been anointed, David was the only person who had any military might. And, and he, at, at which point David went to Jerusalem, to the south, in Benjamin, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, um, basically conquered Jerusalem and had himself proclaimed king. He actually was proclaimed king in, in Hebron, but uh, and himself became king. Saul had um, an oldest son named Ishbosheth, and who apparently wasn't the strongest of people. We actually heard about him uh, last week when we, when we talked about Michal and Ishbosheth. His, 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 Ishbosheth was the brother of Michal and eventually gave Michal to David, back to David. So Ishbosheth wasn't the strongest of person, and his uh, uncle and Abner felt that he should be he should be king, legitimate son of Saul. And he, Abner schleps Ishbosheth all around the northern tribes, trying to get them to support to support him. Uh, we have the story, and this, this doesn't really work out at one point. Abner uh, gets disgusted with Ishbosheth and sleeps with his mistress, whose name was Ritzpah. Excuse me, sleeps with his daughter, whose name was Ritzpah. Now, Ritzpah also was at one point King Saul's concubine. That would make Ishbosheth, that would make. That's like his granddaughter. So Abner is now sleeping <laughs> with his granddaughter. I, today we would call that um, jailbait. Okay. Now Ritzba is the heroine of our of our story. Uh, Ishbosheth gets very angry having to see that, the, learning that Abner has slept with his concubine and his daughter, uh, and Abner deflects to the, to King David. In Ishbosheth then reigned without him for two years, and trust me, he didn't die in his sleep. While this was going on, David struggled to consolidate his power. He barely overcame a revolt led by his son Absalom and was concerned with the threats of Saul's surviving relatives. Now, this was complicated because if you remember in the stories that we read in Hebrew school, every time Saul was trying to kill David, David would say, I will not lay my hand against the king. So, however, Saul had incurred the aminosity of, of, of the, a tribe called the Gibeonites. Uh, he had promised them land and property, and when he became king, uh, he didn't, uh, didn't honor his, prophet, his, his promise, and uh, he violated his oath, oath, and in his zeal, he attempted to wipe them out. Their descendants had not forgotten, and they approached David, and they, David, and they worked out a deal. David couldn't really arrange for, really personally couldn't send his army to take care of Saul's surviving children uh, and relatives, but the Gibeonites were able to do that. Uh, so they had the permission to eliminate Saul's descendants, the seven sons of Saul and two sons of Ritzpah and five sons of, of Saul's eldest daughter, Merab, who was originally promised to David. So, and what happened? And they did it. And they took these bodies and they back to, to, their, to their ancestral land and they hung them up um, like on crosses. The bodies were on crosses. And Ritzvah couldn't allow this. Now there weren't a lot of roads in Jerusalem or roads in Israel at that time, but Apparently what happened is Ritzbah saw what was going on and she went down to the rock of Gibeah and for five mon months she guarded the suspended bodies of her children, preventing their bodies from being devoured by the beasts of prey and the birds of prey. She took a sackcloth and spread it on a rock and she stayed there from the beginning of the harvest until rain from the sky fell on, on their bodies. And she did not let the birds of the sky settle on them by day or the wild beasts approaching by night. 
Now, can you, ima this is, can you imagine what this is like? This, this woman who has, okay, she has a reputation. She's known as a relative of, of Saul. She puts on sackcloth and ashes, goes to one of the few roads that are there, stands in front of her children's bodies and protects them. And you could just imagine how travelers going back and forth, soldiers going back and forth, farmers going back and forth, would see her standing protecting his children day after day, month after month. And the word had to go, get back to David. And it did, it became a very embarrassing scene. You remember years ago, there was a woman in Texas who stood out in front, I believe it was um, the president's house because her son was killed in Vietnam. And she stood there for days and days and days and days until something was finally done. Well, Ritzva became a, a cause celeb. She be, and it became a huge embarrassment for David. And ultimately what David had to do was to um, go and take the bodies and bring them back and bury them in state. Uh, Williams, Cullen, Williams Cullen Bryant wrote a wonderful poem, which I'm not gonna quote, I didn't put on there, about Ritzba and, and her heroism at this time. So to bring this, to, to bring this back into to kind of a conclusion, uh, we, here we have a tremendous act of heroism. And we also see on the part of Ritzba, and at the same time, we also learn a lot more about the character of this man, this king called David, whom our ancestors and legends have built into being a, a, this, a, mess, a messianic figure, a remarkable figure. Uh, the figure who Michelangelo, you know, uh, sculpted and, and, and made into something that, was, that we still think about today. And, and I wonder if there's a lesson here. Just like there might have been a lesson with David and Goliath, that one sometimes when you, or a warning, that when one has this dream and they build their lives to get to a point, as life becomes more, com com more complicated, we change, we adapt, for good or for bad. Here we have a case of heroism. A woman stood up for something which she believed in. She took on the establishment and she, and she forced a change. But was it a change? Did it change David? Well, that we're going to find out in two weeks. Let you know then. Next week, we're going to talk about Levites. And the following week, we'll see, learn about David, his love life, and his relationship with his children. Any questions or? Yes, Ed. Oh, it's Gary. Gary, okay. Um, so in a sense, uh, to me, it looks like a similar analogy, David slayed Goliath, and in a different sense, Ritzpah slayed David. Excellent. That's very good. And I hate to bring politics into this, but we have a bully as president, and the only thing that this bully couldn't take care of and got bullied is this virus. Okay. <laughs> you get it? Any other comments? Yeah, Rabbi Simon, I have a question. Uh, do I understand that uh, Rizpa, uh, who was, you said, Saul's concubine, wouldn't he also be his granddaughter? Yes. Whoa. Yes, as I said, the jailbait. And this is a kind of questioning the, the morality there. Uh, wow. Uh, the, are, are, are the kings then don't, haven't, don't, don't act, well, haven't acted or don't act that much different than some of the kings today. Uh, David, for example, and we'll talk about that in two weeks, loved the ladies. Not only did he have seven wives that we know about, but the text also says he had numerous concubines. So as Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. Yeah, and, and it's, you can imagine, and, the, and then there's that wonderful October about this, which is completely misunderstood, that when David is on his death, in his deathbed, and the politics surrounding him are trying to negotiate, Bathsheba is trying to negotiate that Solomon will become his successor, as opposed to Adinojaya, which we'll talk about in another time. David is told he takes a young girl, a young virgin, and she lies on top of him mm. uh, to, warm, to warm him, if you remember this story. Well, that's actually a, a sign of sexual um, inadequacy, not uh, 
set, not of proficiency, um, at least certainly in the ancient in the ancient world. So mm -hmm. we have um, th th these these were very colorful characters. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't mean to, to smash anybody's bubble here, and um, though I will smash a couple in the next two weeks, but I think that there'll be some. Uh, multiple explanations and challenges and questions, which will make it all better. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yes. But I'm saying that uh, with David, that Saul's descendants would not have been able to keep uh, Israel together because they all seem weak from what I'm seeing here. I can't hear you. Uh, it seems that David's, that Saul's descendants uh, were so weak that he probably could not have kept Israel together. That's correct. That's correct. That's one of the reasons. That's why. That's why Abner left Saul's oldest son Ishbosheth, and you know went over to David's camp. Um, and Saul did not provide. Well, he didn't think he would die, but provide, provide for succession. Um, neither did David. David, and frankly, Solomon didn't do such a good job either. But we may or may not come to that in the, in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I want to thank Rabbi Simon for the wonderful presentation. I want to thank all the participants. Uh, next week, next Tuesday, actually, we will have uh, uh, Rabbi Cohen, I think his name is, and Rabbi Simon will be speaking next Wednesday. Uh, look for your email. You will get all the information about that. Or if not, you can go on fjmc.org. Under webinars, you will get the uh, link for Zoom conferences for next time. Alan, can we possibly ch change that? I have a conflict next Wednesday. Can we possibly okay. switch that by phone to Wednesday? Would you rather do Monday or do, what day? Um, I, 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 I'd rather do Tuesday. Well, we, we already have something for Tuesday. I'm sorry. Could you try to switch him? I've got commitments on Monday night and Wednesday night. Yeah, unfortunately, we, we're not able to. It's something that's coming from, from an outside source. Okay. Um, well, so then, then we'll make it Monday night. Okay, we'll change. We'll change next week's to Monday. That part that'll be part three. It'll be Monday night. Okay. All right. Good. I'm gonna stop recording now. Good to see you.